מתחברים אל הקיר, אין עם מי לדבר. אם רק נבין שכולנו אחד נראה, הכל מתחבר. שישרף רכושך, תשרף נשמתך. אם לא תמהר להציל את עצמך. רצחנו אדמה, ורצחנו נשמה. כמעט ולא נשאר לנו אוויר לנשימה. והעולם, בתנועה מתמדת, עושה סיבוב. Fagit, can you hear? Welcome. Yes. yes. Welcome, welcome. We're present, we're here, we're, and we're ready to receive such incredible process. Um, artistic, from the artistic talents of uh, the artist Chagit Cohen, and through the explorations with the studies of Rabbi Chazen Jessica Meyer, we're extremely honored and privileged to uh, be present for uh, Torah, art, and soul in a beautiful way. Um, the, we have, um, to, as introduction, Rabbi Chazen Jessica Meyer, um, former actress, presently uh, pastoral servant, um, has served for the past four in the past uh, under the synagogue Romamu in New York City, and is I've been at the kitchen for the past three and a half years. And in the at the kitchen in San Francisco for the past three and a half years, um, and Chagit, um, Israel-born artist, is interested in creating immersion environments that promote an awareness of the dichotomy between the fragility and strength of nature. By focusing on close investigation of natural elements, she brings the viewer closer to the understanding that we are a part of nature and that we need to care for it as we care for ourselves. And today, we have the beautiful opportunity um, to explore nature and human nature in an extremely personal and beautiful way. So without further ado, Rabbi Chazen, please frame the Parsha for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dvir, for also for um, inviting me to be a part of this and allowing me to get to learn um, and create with, um, with my friend, uh, with Chagi and teacher Chagi Cohen. Um, hold on one second. For some reason, I am now. There we go. Um, so I want to start with a nigun and then dive into the parsha. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
in chapter 10 of Leviticus of Vayikra and we were terrified because this parsha is um, troubling, unanswerable, terrifying. The death, the murder seemingly by God of Aaron's two oldest sons, Nadav and Avihu, who came with their own offering an offering with with Esh Zara, um, with a strange fire. And they bring this, and in the moment they are consumed by divine fire, with almost the same exact wording as earlier that day, the divine fire had consumed the, um, the offering, the sacrificial offering um, that Aaron had offered on the altar. And we showed up studying together and with many, many questions um, and also with this sense of, um, of, of fear and terror of, of approaching this particular scene in Torah. Um, so we came in and first we began by studying um, really the, the, whole, the nature of the sacrificial system and not really the, like, the nuts and bolts, the blood and guts and smoke of, of the, the process of making sacrificial offerings. So often, you know, today when we approach Leviticus, we approach it psycho-spiritually, we want to get to the heart of the meaning of these gifts that we brought to, you know, to really deepen our relationship with the divine. What we wanted to get at was the real, the physicality um, and the, the acts, the physical acts and actions of the rituals around sacrifice. So we began studying um, these, you know, the blood and guts, and we moved from there into, um, into the particular offering that Nadav, Nadav and Avihu brought and what, was, what their strange fire um, was made of. And um, and then finally, we came to, to land in, in the silence of Aharon after, after Nadav and Avihu are consumed um, from bringing their offering. Moses, you know, engages, tries to engage Aharon in conversation with very confusing language. I always interpreted it as a kind of like what not to do when you go to a Shiva minion. And Moses, you know, is speaking and it's indecipherable and Aharon is silent. Vaidom Aharon. And that's where, um, where we, we landed in the end. But it was this process um, of studying together over a number of different meetings, both over Zoom, over meals um, at Chagit's beautiful home with her husband, Neil, in the East Bay. And... Um, uh, to really, it's been a, a process also of, you know, there's much grieving in this particular Parsha in this scene and the chance to also kind of grieve as we were learning um, this, these two lost um, lives and in uh, this unanswerable question. Um, so starting there, we can go deeper into the Parsha as well, but I wanted to kind of bring that framing and um, and then turn it over to to Hagit. Hi everyone. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying that the process of learning with Rabbi Jessica Mayer was such a delightful process. I just love delving deep into the text and 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 I, I, we had so many questions that we had to look 
elsewhere for answers because the text itself doesn't always give you an answer. It leaves you with more questions than answers. And so um, just before uh, we're gonna show the image, I just wanted to say that um, the, maybe we should show the image actually, it will give context rather than so. Um, when I created the image for this, um, this incredible moment in the story where first there is the sacrificial ritual and then the death of uh, Davina view her own sons in such a quick brief moment. Um, so I, as I created the image, I had decided to add the text that describe how God's fire came and consumed the two sons and they died in front of God. And, um, and, and I couldn't decide between using the image with the text and the image without the text. So I am, because this is a process of learning, I'm sharing it with you and, um, and would love at some point when we open to question to hear um, what the audience thinks, which, which image works best. Um, so, but just to kind of give a context, I've been photographing elements of nature, elements that we usually don't see very much. We sometimes kind of kick with our, with our, with our feet when we hike. Um, I photograph those elements to show that they have a language, a story to tell, and that they have an agency um, in the creation of our lives, right? The, the cycle of nature. I photographed a lot of um, seeds and, 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 and um, tree pods, and I, I am attracted to what they have to say. And I usually also am attracted to their sculptural quality and a three-dimensional quality. So this is the context of my work in general. Um, I'm wondering, Dvir, you can move to the next image. Oops, I don't know that I have control over that. Uh, anyway, I guess those images are presented really in large scale and they have the, the kind of, they, they create a visceral kind of, uh, reaction in, in, in the viewer because you, you, you see those small little things with such a great attention to details. So, so uh, about the image that I created for this um, project, um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I was in the UC Botanical Garden and uh, visiting the garden and I kind of landed next to a palm tree that had some kind of a disease and it was a little bit abnormal. And the fronds that usually of a palm tree, they usually open beautifully, could not open and they were deformed. And of course, it was fascinating to me and attracted my attention. And I brought it to the studio and photographed it. And I, I loved the image, but I didn't know in one context to use it. So when we studied, this uh, parasha, first dealing with all the gruesome details of, of, the, of the sacrificial process, the, the innards of the animals and the blood and the parts, some parts being thrown outside of the camp inside some parts stay um, are being sacrificed. Um, so I kind of like thought that this image had kind of like captured that. On top of it, it is it is a bit menacing and it has like an ominous lurking um, presence. And it causes a really strong visceral ex kind of reaction for me when I photographed it. And so, and so initially I thought of using it. And then as we studied the, the death of, uh, her own son, Nadav and Avihu, as they sacrificed their sacrifice, their sacrificial right after her own and being consumed by God, it felt even more so. And I'll just, and I don't want to put too many details, but I'll just say that 
um, at the end, when we studied about how Aharon could not grieve in public and he could not grieve at all because he was not supposed to get out of the tabernacle and he was silenced, I thought that leaving this image on a white background, kind of so quiet, yet holding a huge amount of movement and being stopped, I felt that that also uh, represented Aharon's silence and the mama and how he, he had to be quiet. Uh, last of it, I'll mention the use of the text um, that I thought to play with the text that describe how God's fire came out and consumed Aharon and uh, Aharon's two sons. And, um, and the text kind of disappear and appear like the fire. A, a quick moment, they're gone. They had life and here they're gone. So I like to play with the fact that it's kind of like it's not fully clear, but it is in the title. So I think I'll, I'll stop here. Sure, more things will come up as we have questions. Anyway, back. Something, um, Chagit, like, and in, in, can we look at the image as well again? So when, when you first showed me this image, just, so there was like on the visceral level that, you know, the, the gnarled, the, the kind of fiery, the sort of accordion and like the almost what felt like these rivulets to the side and then the kind of the trunk in the front. And in addition to the, um, the visceral reaction, just like this kind of religious reaction or, you know, it sent me back into the text in a very different way. Um, something that we had talked about is you know, the, the role of palm fronds as a ritual, um, you know, implement that we, you know, that the, the lulav, which we shake on Sukkot, um, which is also like just bringing these, you know, to mind the priests and this, this holy action, but then so, you know, the, the form of this particular palm frond is so shrunken and, uh, and mutated um, kind of like as the the imagining the immolation of the priests and the um, the holders of of this ritual work, and then the the other thing that um, I, I really kept looking at the front um, and seeing the kind of the intestines um, being flayed, um, you know, it just like the the gruesomeness of the um, of the sacrifices. And, and then something which we were, you know, really sitting with together, particularly in our last conversation, the movement that the Hebrew, um, the movement of dam, of blood. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, there is an echo of the shofar in the, in the front as well. Um, the movement from dam, from blood, the blood of the sacrifices um, to de mama, to um, Aaron's silence, Vayidom Aharon. So from this this interconnectedness of the roots of the 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 words themselves of blood, the relationship between blood, silence, and um, and and the inanimate, uh, dume, dum, um, domem, um, something that is inanimate, and the relationship like this kind of pulsing. Um, pulsating blood in the veins to this, um, the silence and the kind of petrification of Aharon's emotional response and the kind of petrification in this, in this piece. Um, and, um, and I'll, I'll also just add that what really strikes me in getting to know your work, Chagit, is that what you do is give voice to the inanimate. Like you take what is domem and it is coming to life, um, you know, in front of your lens and just sort of the reverse process of um, domem to de mama to, um, to dam, to like this beating the blood coursing through. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say that as you speak, I think about the fact that you know, this is a dead piece of uh, of uh, kind of like a 
of a tree, right? It's dry, it's dead, it's already been taken out, yet it's so alive with its movement, with the kind of fiery fronds and the blood and how it's almost forced to stop. It looks like it's forced to stop. And um, so that's another kind of aspect of life and death that is so, so strong in this parasha, yeah. And one part of the project that I loved was coming back into the text to write a short um, Dvar Torah um, to really to re-enter the, the, the parsha through this piece. And I was saying to Chagit that I was, as I was writing kind of in a stream of consciousness, I was, I was sitting here with, um, with this piece in front of my, just as I was, as I was writing. Where are we? <laughs> <laughs> Devere, I'm wondering, Huggy, what do you think about moving to, to questions and thoughts? Sure, that'd be great. So something that's... Um... Uh, being brought up uh, in the questions is um, that, and you've brought it up also, is the the flame of of the outside, and then also on the inside, the the red, the blood, it kind of is its own flame, and like wondering if if of your thoughts of who in the text do you see this this object as? Is it the flame? Is it Aaron? Is it the animals? Hmm. What's the character that this this image embodies? I'll start and Jessica, maybe you can continue. I I think it's a beautiful question because at at different time, uh, in the beginning it was the sacrifice, and then it was God's fire, the wrath and, 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 and the danger of it and, and the scary monster of it. And then eventually it is a Horon who is forced to be silent and he, he the mom, he, he, the mom also in Hebrew is bleed. So I'm sure his heart was bleeding and, and but then he was, had to be silenced and couldn't grieve or mourn outwardly his the death of his two sons so so it's it's all of it together in a way and and that's what i kind of i like about using this image it doesn't i mean how can how can you bring an image of such strong part of the story in any other way than a metaphor to me right and and that I feel it contains it all. It's a great question, thanks. And for me, the first thing that comes is like, this is all that, rem this is what remains. Mm -hmm. Like in the face of the story, like, right? This is what remains. Um, and it's hideous, <laughs> like it's both stunning and hideous. Yeah. Um, and also like it's contorted the, you know, I think initially when, when we first um, had been kind of studying the image alongside the text together, I was thinking of that the trunk or the shofar or the intestine as also Aaron and the experience when like of the experience of Aaron who was now, you know, he had been anointed with oil and blood and he, you know, and his brother Moshe says, you can't, you can't show any outward signs of grief or mourning. That's going to be for the people because you have a job to do. And this idea of like the expectation in leadership of, of contorting oneself mm. and the inability to actually, um, to grieve. So that was like more than his silence was like that kind that experience of of his contorting in order to um, move forward and continue to and, and to lead. Um, so that and I always but actually that's the 
the back piece, the sort of hair, <laughs> um, uh, and like the the flattened rivulet, um, I always saw as as also as God's fire as well. Like this sort of um, it's uncontrollable, unpredictable, and then it just lands, and it's stunning and awesome and horrific. Um, Um, Naomi Kramer um, notes the the use of the shadow and how this this image is is encased within its own shadow. And I, in some of your other work, Chagit, uh, you use the shadow very um, meticulously, where you have uh, um, the shadow playing a, a, an operational role. Um, what can can you? give us more insight into how this image was photographed and at the time, what were your thoughts of, of the shadow's role, even before the conception of, the, of thinking about it in light of the story? Yeah, uh, um, well, I usually do uh, try to play meticulously with the shadow because I think the shadow becomes part of the image and contributes to the image. And uh, so it creates almost a new image of its own. And then it holds the, 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 the image of the pods or, or in this particular case, the frond, the palm frond. So um, I, they always play a, a major role in, 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 in my work. So I'm really glad. Thank you, Naomi, for um, observing that and um, and kind of in 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 as a, in retrospect, right now that we're talking about the image in the context of the parasha and the whole story, I yes, the story has a lot of shadow. I mean, it's 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 really there's some dark elements of this the story, and I feel like it, without the shadow, you wouldn't even have that because I think it's kind of almost grounds the story and it's always in the Torah that the story has the light part and the beauty and then the dark part it's so much part of the stories that we read from the Torah so um yeah it, it, at the end it worked so I'm really glad that it fits yeah and um Nancy, uh, Nancy Newman uh, suggests that there's something very powerful about um, the letters kind of coming to the forefront. And um, this piece is, is like in conversation exactly with the text itself. Um, what are your thoughts on the, the relationship between, um, ha you had described a little bit of of uh, now the texts have new, the text has new meaning, but you've literally danced the letters um, and embedded them into the image. Yeah, as 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 I shared, it was a tough decision for me, and I'm still not uh, fully uh, um, complete with this process, whether to use the text or not. I'm not a graphic person and text is really not my tool. So it's, um, I've been using it in the last piece that I did for the Laba project and um, which you might wanna show it or we can skip it and just uh, stay with this. But um, the only way I could kind of like bring the text is like in the same movement that I felt that the image was because it's kind of like, it's the same expression. And so I had to kind of like make the text move um, just like the fronds. And also I like the fact that it's not clear because I didn't want to be so clear with the text because it, 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 it's an image. It's uh, uh, and, and so, yeah, here's an example of how I use text in the last piece that I did about, uh, you know, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And so um, I wanted the text to be part of the image and not separated from the image. I did try to separate from the image, but then it's kind of lost it for me. And so um, it, it, 
as I said, since it's not my forte, I was very ambivalent about using it. But initially, I kind of, I, I, I kind of like it. But as I said, I'm not 100% sure about it. So any, any input uh, from the audience will be highly appreciated. Was there uh, like one of the words that it shows up twice in the sentence that is like the, that is obscured, obscured both times is, is God's name. Was there a, a decided choice of, of not necessarily knowing where God fits into the story? Yeah, I, I, because I could play, I could play with it a little bit up to a point. Uh, and yes, in some ways, it's kind of really the mystery of how, you know, in the story, it's clear that it was the God's fire, but life is kind of like you, you know, you can have the different interpretation of tragedy. And, and um, I, I kind of like it that God is not fully present. Thanks for noticing it. It's great. And also um, something that, that I noticed was the, the rivulets as you described them. Um, it feels kind of like a process of, of trauma where when something spikes up, it affects you. You can patch it over, but you still have kind of the topography of the trauma uh, continued and it shapes all the way through to the end, that little bump in the middle. Um, I'm curious um, from both of your perspectives, uh, not in the moment itself, but the conversation of Aaron beyond this moment, how does it shape him and, and the experience of trauma is something that's so relatable to, to all of us today. Jessica, you wanna? <laughs> Oof. Um, the rivulet of trauma um, written through, um, you know, he is now like, he's at the beginning of his high priesting and, um, you know, um, uh, to enter into, you know, this, uh, level of work and responsibility i mean i i just I, my first thought is is prayer um that his ability to serve um was uh you know it was 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 probably sadly and unfortunately um maybe even deeper um from this you know from experiencing this level of loss um, I honestly, like, I don't even want to respond to this question. <laughs> there was a great article in the New Yorker a few weeks ago. Um, I forgot who it was by, but about, it's called like the trauma plot, um, about how we, you know, uh, the way we write fiction, the way we see, um, you know, film, that trauma, you know, the point of trauma becomes kind of like the, the shadow or the, overarching um, theme that to explain someone's behavior and um, I like that in this piece it just kind of speaks for itself like yeah I um, I wonder how how it went on to impact Aaron um, mm -hmm. and it's also um, you know like he takes that with him that kind that secret yeah I also wanted to add something that just as you spoke, Jessica, came to my mind about trauma, that they say that trauma, part of the reason trauma is so powerful because it gets lodged in our experience and get frozen. And the only way to kind of like uh, help people with trauma is to kind of uh, get them to re-experience their traumatic experience so it's not frozen in their experience. And I'm thinking, this image is very frozen, right? It's a, it's a, you know, photography is like that. It takes a mo, it it freezes a moment in time, and um, so in that respect, the the thing that happened is is frozen in this image in a way. You know, that's mm. kind of a bit. Of I also, Hagi was just thinking, you know, something that we learn from trees in particular is places of 
physical trauma in the tree and how one grows, you know, grows around or in a different direction as a result. And just like that actually becomes even more clear, um, just even, you know, in this image itself. Um, does that, did that make sense? Um, yeah. Um, and uh, also we have a question mm. from, from Rabbi Kahana that's very interesting about um, the text centers around the reaction to the deaths of, uh, from Aaron's perspective. But what about from Aaron's wife's perspective? And also in mm -hmm. contrast, um, their death very much echoes the Akedah, which is also a very challenging text that focuses on uh, perhaps Abraham's lack of, of compassion in the moment versus Sarah's deep mm -hmm mourning in that moment that uh, the rabbis say caused her death that this is it's a beautiful question and there there are there's echoes um for sure and i don't know any midrashim of elisheva um to, i mean the the ones of sarah are so poignant and i um i did do you do you know of any does any um any Midrashe, Elisheva, I, I, that's a great, maybe they need to be written. Hmm. And perhaps there's something about um, Aaron's character that is so nurturing, that, hmm. that echoes that uh, maternal instinct of Sarah. Yeah, I mean, his, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Hmm. Um. Part of uh, what, you, what was described earlier was about um, that there's a very central connection to the palm frond um, and temple ritual and practice. And it's this shape is very much not the shape of a lulav. It ends up almost returning into an etrog-esque shape. Um, <laughs> and I think uh, there's, there's something about, I, I wonder how you both feel and, and to hear your, your um, responses about um, the role of anomalies and the role, the, the lack of tolerance in the temple regarding um, things that deviate from the norm, which was part of the cause of, of their own deaths was that it was, it was a foreign fire. Chagit, you or me? Uh, <laughs> I prefer that you start if you don't mind. <laughs> sure. Um, so, I mean, it, uh, you know, it always brings me back to uh, a friend of mine who is a Kohen and who is, um, who is disabled and talks about how, you know, like he can't read the laws of, um, of the temple of the Mishkan. He can't, you know, bear to come back every year to read about the, you know, the priests, um, uh, perfection or that, you know, they have, um, that they, that in order to serve, that they have to meet a particular physical or even, um, spiritual requirement for um to to serve and i think i've definitely internalized um that anger with the text like yes we can reread it and say no you know this is um we, we can make all kinds of um psycho spiritual interpretations but it is it's a deeply deeply troubling text um I mean, a deeply troubling vision of of what um, who can serve, um, yeah, and also wondering, you know, bringing and bringing in the Eish Zara brings in for me this other piece of, you know, what is what is the role of creativity in offerings in connection with the divine? What is, you know. Um, 
who is allowed to show up if this is about you know if if there this was a punishment if their death was a punishment is it that they went you know beyond their clearance um you know is it just the questions that it raises about um who can serve how we serve and with you know can we bring our own um inspiration creativity into service or are we required to to serve um within you know very strict structures yeah i, I want to say something that kind of like takes it a little away from the question but maybe it's still relevant is um when i saw that deformed tree in the botanical garden this is in california where we're experiencing a severe drought and we're experiencing severe fires as, as, as a result of the drought. And um, initially, when I, I, I took this image, I thought, about, I thought about that. I thought about the, the tragedy of, of something that we brought maybe to the tree to make it deformed, maybe some, some uh, toxic, stream or some fungus, something. I, I, don't know, I thought that maybe we are kind of uh, yeah. the cause of this deformed tree. And um, so it was all, always holding for me an image of like something bad that is going to happen or is happening in, inside of us and in our lives. So I don't know if that, if that um, answer some of the question of like something that so perfect and something that deformed that we need to look at the deformity sometimes in our society right to see where healing needs to come so it's kind of a, a long way to get back to that mm. question and, and also uh, the connection a lot of times with at the temple was a conversation with god regarding drought and weather and praying to God for some, these things that are out of our control beyond our scope. Those were the questions that allowed those conversations to initiate. Yeah. Um, uh, Peggy uh, brought up a very interesting, uh, something that she had noticed. And I'm, I'm also very curious uh, to hear um, this role of this this uh, bleeding heart in the middle, um, this opening, there, there's a suggestion that perhaps it's like an opening up of the Mishkan. The, this is the grand unveiling and the cutting of the ribbon, but also we're peering into the inside of this palm frond. And uh, um, I'm curious to hear uh, how both of you see the role of this peeking into the inside what role it has in, in the conversation of this piece? Well, we had that conversation, Jessica, right? Um, and and uh, I think that was also very rich because each one of us saw different things and kind of like we build on each other. Um, so first, of course, the the blood and, and the fire that are um, the elements in the story right the elements in the story of the sacrifice sacrificing that happens and then the the it's the same fire that uh consumed the sacrifice the sacrificial offering by aharon is also did consume his two sons so so it's blood and fire and to me also the pain of where we are in our kind of uh, ecological place so it's all kind of connected to that for me i also love so in the version of it with the text vatochal otam it's kind of it's actually like it becomes also this mouth um you know the it's consuming right the fire is consuming but it's also it's eating like there is um so this it feels like this gaping um mouth yeah the monster is coming towards you can i say <laughs> can i say uh what you nicknamed the nickname for the piece sure okay <laughs> um 
So Hagit was calling it Medusa. Um, and we were referring to it, uh, you know, of, we would call it Medusa, um, just as like for shorthand when we were talking about the piece, um, which was also funny because I don't know, Hagit and I both have very curly hair. And when I was a child, my nickname, one of my nicknames was Medusa. And um, but uh, yeah, just this this image of of monster um, really came up and and it becomes its own character for sure. Um, does anyone want to bravely come forth with any questions and, and mm -hmm. ask? It's, it's, it's such a, a rich piece. It's just, it's, it's fertile with every angle, every, every component of it feels, feels like it's, there, there's so much decision inside of, uh, and speaks so perfectly. It's, it's such a challenge to, um, to, as an artist, you have control of the strokes in, in a lot of visual art of what ends up being depicted can be visualized inside the mind's eye. But with photography, there, there's, it's much more restricted and yet you've expanded us into this conversation uh, that's, that's just, it feels, like we're winding through and seeing the text with new eyes. Does anyone, does anyone want to contribute to and, and come, come ask, ask a question? I'll just say quickly uh, that ultimately the process, the, the way I work is very initially very intuitive. So I am attracted to something, I photograph it and I have a dialogue with it for a while until it comes to life in, in, in one way or another. So it, it's such a rich, interesting process for me to, to see that the intuition initially kind of uh, that I felt in my heart and in, in my body, even before I could think about it in my head, that is, that is, that it, that I, you know, that's the process. I trust it because eventually it did, it does come with its own story. I just want to add that. Do we know God better from what happened to not happen to you? Hmm. The question being, do we know God better afterwards, after the story, from what <laughs> happened to Nadav and Avihu? I know people a lot better mm. <laughs> after this story, but I'm dodging the question, <laughs> Rabbi. Um, yeah, and so through people, I know God better too, but that's yeah. Chagit? Yes. Yeah, hi, this is it. So at the beginning, you asked a question about the worlds and the photo. And I, and I think they complement each other tremendously. Uh, and uh, they, the worlds definitely do something. And I, I love the way that God is being kind of erased. And it reminds me of Sota. I don't know if anybody knows the, the procedure of Sota, but mm -hmm. when a husband accuses a woman of infidelity, anyway, one of the, or one step of the procedure is to bear in God's name. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of connected me with, with the wife of Aaron, mm -hmm. who is missing, who is missing you know, from the from the story the what and that is more of like a right it's the washing out the erasing through like the right, exactly. the name in the water versus in the fire um just... right so here is a fire and in sota it's water but you know the both obviously elements of creation I, I wanted to say just one thing about Tochal, the other 
part of this Parsha is Kashrut. You know, it's the laws of Kashrut. And when I look at the image, you know, I see, I see veget, you know, it's vegetative, but it's also very animal like in some way. There's like an interiority which feels like internal organs and things like that. I find, you know, the Nadav and Avihu stories so, um, it's just so distressing, but in some ways, you know, we're talking about tochal and what it is that gets consumed. And in the same part we deal with, you know, what we consume, what we can consume and what we don't and what is, what is fit and what is unfit to eat and what is, you know, I think there's a lot about, you know, just questioning altogether what is, what is holy and what isn't it somehow like interior exterior in some way and i think your piece really contrasts that i you. love what you just i love that and also it, it feels like trafe right like this yes. just feels yes. like an animal that's been ripped apart yes yes it does yeah <laughs> so yeah well, another uh, image that comes to mind is the, uh, the redness that you have in the middle. So when we read Shmini, we, we also take another Sefer Torah and we read the portion of Para Aduma. That's right. So, so the red really uh, brings it to mind and kind of connects the two pieces and the two parashot. That's true. Thank you. That's uh, interesting. Just a quick thing over here. Go ahead. Hi, Aki. I Everybody? can't see. I can't see, I guess. I'm Gordon Saffron. Oh, hi. Hey, Saffron. Oh, wow. Hello, Gordon. <laughs> First of all, Aki, when you said something you felt in your feet, in your belly, in your mind, it wasn't really all of that. It was part of it. you were being pinched by your husband. Anyhow, I shouldn't have said that either. But it's really good hearing you. You, you were excellent. The program was excellent. And it makes me feel good to be Jewish. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lee, as well. It's good to see you. And, I, and thank and you for all the comments. I just wanted to say I'm very uh, taken. I, I, I'm not so good at responding in chat because I'm kind of like I try to stay in the conversation, but I appreciate all the comments. And I think um, what's so interesting also is that this image was part of your, your archive and, it, the, and the Torah interpretation conjured up and it, you brought, you fused those two things together. And I think with, uh, with photography where you take something in nature and you bring, it, uh, bring, bring new meaning to it and you see it with new eyes, even though your hand wasn't involved in every, in the creation of the object itself, but you've frozen it in time and observed it and allowed it to uh, build that meaning is very much in line with the rabbinic uh, process of Torah interpretation, where we don't get to choose the, the words and the stories and the letters. And yet, we're forced to stare at it. And we're forced to, to think about what, what are ways that we can bring add relevance to it. And by staring at it, you take this, this um, palm frond that perhaps wouldn't have had meaning otherwise, would have just lived the rest of its life um, separated from, from its roots and you've allowed it to still be alive. And I think what both of you have done um, in this project is allowed the story, allowed the Torah to be alive in a very vital way. And it's, it just, it adds such holiness by creating new interpretations, it adds such depth to be able to see um, each curl as being another metaphor that synchronizes us with this conversation that we've been engaging with uh, for thousands of years. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I wanna, I wanna thank 
thank the Amen Institute and Veer for such a beautiful project and, and for Rabbi Jessica Mayer, who without her, it wouldn't have happened. So <laughs> I really, really appreciate it and appreciate all of you participating in this dialogue. Thank you so much. Have, have a lovely evening for those on the East Coast and a hearty afternoon for those in the West. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everyone. Oh, thank you. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Shabbat thank shalom. You. Shabbat shalom. Bye-bye. <laughs>